I seriously wonder if anyone walks by and sees like these filming lights in my bedroom and thinks, what is this girl doing? Because they're like kind of big. Um, but that's not what this video is about. So what's up you guys? Welcome back. If you are new, my name is Jess. Be sure to smash that subscribe button before you go. And thank you so much for being here. Today's video is going to be halfway house stories. Now, I was talking to my good friend Brian Bruton the other night on his live stream. He does these live streams where you can call him and like be on the phone with him and ask him anything. They're really, really fun. So I called him when I was talking to him and I was reminded of living in a halfway house and I thought, dang, that was the struggle. So I need to share that with you guys. So without further ado, here is living in a halfway house. Now, when I got out of prison in Arkansas, I had nowhere to go. So I met a friend in prison and she told the parole office that I could stay with her. Now parole in Arkansas looks a lot different than parole in New York and I will explain the difference, but in Arkansas they just called and they said, hey, Jessica Kent is up for parole, can she go to your house? And she said, yes, she can. The parole office never verified that address. and. You know, I didn't really know anything about it. I just knew, I guess I'm gonna go here and then I'll figure it out. I had also gotten into a halfway house, but the halfway house that I got into charged $100 a week and I knew I was not gonna be able to pay that. So I said, all right, I'll let you help me. I'll go to your address. So I got out on an EPA. That means I was eligible for release a little bit early because of overcrowding. I got out two weeks early, which doesn't sound like a big deal, but it's a big deal. Like two weeks early, um, is something that I was so grateful for. I would have been grateful for one day early. A lot of the men get out like six months or a year early because of overcrowding because there are more men than women. So I got out and I'll never forget walking out of those doors, going up to Sallyport, changing out, putting uh, donation clothes on because they took my clothes in Arkansas. I didn't have the money to send them home so I just had them throw them out when I arrived at prison. Horrible situation, but I had to walk out with my shower shoes on. They kept my Bob Barkers and I was wearing sweatpants and like some vest or whatever. Another friend, shout out to you girl, you know who I'm talking about, picked me up from prison and took me out to Hibachi, which like was amazing. I threw up, but it was amazing. Anyway, I was overwhelmed that first day, so excited. And she picked me up in Newport, Arkansas and then drove me all the way to Searcy, Arkansas and then all the way to Russellville, Arkansas, which is where I pulled up to. It's about, Searcy and Russellville are probably two hours apart. And I'm so grateful to you girl for doing that and picking me up with your baby and your man, taking me all the way to Russellville, that's amazing. So thank you so much. I showed up at this chick's house and I walked in and her son was in drug court, her um, son was in drug court, oh no, I'm sorry, her stepdad was on parole, her son was in drug court, there was another girl we were in prison with on parole, and then she was on parole. I walked in and I'm like, girl, I can't stay here, like, everyone's on paper, this is not gonna work, this is illegal, because in New York, they never would've let that fly, ever, they're so strict in New York, and she's like, no, it's good, they don't check, they don't check, I'm like, they don't ever come to your house, and she's like, no, they don't, and I thought, I have to work a DHS case, I can't stay here. And my friend was like, girl, just come home with me. And I said, no, I have to report here in the morning. I have to report to this parole officer. So I let her leave me there and she really did not want to leave me there, but uh, she did because <laughs> I made her. I'm like, go home, take care of your baby. I got it, it's okay, I'll be fine. So I crashed on this girl's couch and I was grateful for it. I, I had nowhere to go. So it was awesome that she helped me, but it was also not the way I needed, not the way I wanted helped. I wanted to do it the right way. So in the morning, she took me to the parole office. I reported to parole and the officer was really nice, which also, excuse me, was kind of a new thing for me, to be completely honest. I said, hey, I wanna be upfront with you. I need to tell you the truth about something. My friend helped me get out of prison and I didn't know that everyone was on parole. I can't stay here. Can you please, excuse me, can you please approve a transfer to Springdale, Arkansas? I got into this halfway house, I will show up there. And she just looked at me and she's like, no one's ever been that honest before. And I'm like, oh, um, okay. So is it okay that I transfer to this halfway house? And she said, I'll put that through. And she just kind of smiled at me like, just sit here, just hold on, I'll put that through for you. You know, and I'm sitting in her office and I'm getting so nervous because I'm like, is she really being nice to me? Or like, did I just make a mistake? I just told her the truth. And I had never really been so honest with parole officers before. This is like new territory for me and I was just really scared. She walks back in and she goes, okay, sign this right here. This is the address of the halfway house. And I said, yeah. And she goes, okay, let's call the people. 
I said, thank you so much for helping me. And she said, thank you for being honest. And I was just like blown away that she was so nice and so helpful. I still remember what she looks like to this day. Like she's, she was very pretty and very nice. Not that being pretty matters, but I just remember what she looks like. And I signed the papers and she said, do you have a ride? And I said, no, I'll just have to hustle up and find one. And she said, all right, I will let you do that. And best of luck to you. And she right there approved my transfer to go from Russellville, Arkansas to Springdale, Arkansas. And this was a three quarters house, not a halfway house. It was a three quarters house because you could come and go kind of as you pleased. You had to pay rent, you had to go to meetings, you had to work the program, all of that stuff. You had to provide your own hygiene items, your own food. And that was kind of a struggle for me. So I showed up there and it was a situation where the person in charge of the three quarters house kicked a bunch of people out and said, this is not how we do things here. They weren't paying rent, so we kind of took over. And she said, uh, Jessica, I'm gonna kind of lean on you here and I need your help with this because it was me and one other girl that stayed, that got to stay. Everyone else was kind of abusing the freedom of the three quarters house. And I said, okay, what do you need me to do? And she said, first of all, we need furniture. So let's go to secondhand stores and try to get furniture. And the state gave her grants to pay for these things. And I helped her with everything she needed help with. I helped people leave from Decision Point, that's a rehab, to go to our three quarters house. I approved them to get in. And she kind of just gave me a lot of leniency here. And she gave me the opportunity to to kind of pick who I had in there, which are the rules of an Oxford house. It's a, it's a democracy and everyone chooses. But when you're alone, you have to kind of make these decisions on your own. So one of the girls I was staying with at the halfway house, she said, girl, I know what it's like to leave from prison. Like, I just want you to know this is an open closet house. You can borrow my stuff, borrow my shoes whenever you want. If you need shoes, if you need a sweater, I got you. And I'm like, oh my God, thank you so much. That's amazing, thank you. So I borrowed her Nikes and I had to go to a job. Oh, also she said, I know this place called Eaton and it's a telemarketing place, they'll hire anyone. I didn't have an ID, but she's like, let's go, I'll get you a job. And I'm like, girl, I got it. Let's give me those Nikes, what's up? And I go up there and they hired me on the spot and it was for $7.50 an hour. And that first day, like as soon as I got there, I worked 12 hours that day and I was so grateful for it. Even though it was $7.50 an hour, my first check was like, what, 60 bucks? But I was so grateful for that because I didn't have anything else. And the girl that I was staying with at the halfway house was really kind and let me borrow clothes until I could get clothes. So what I would do is every paycheck, I'd go to Plato's closet, get a couple shirts, maybe a pair of pants, and I would just try to hustle things up from there. I have a spirit that is like, I'm not gonna let you get me down. I know the situation's tough, I'm gonna fight through it. With that being said, I was um, offered a lot of things when I got out of prison. I'm gonna try to say this without incriminating anyone, but I had connections that most people do not. I'm not bragging, I'm not flexing, I'm literally just trying to tell you guys my situation. I had people calling me from prison saying, just use my name, go to this address, and I will, they'll give you stuff to sell. I guess I'll just say it. They'll give you drugs to sell. And they're like, you can front this, you can front that, use my name, I already called them for you, here's the address. They had it all set up and I said, whoa, 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 I can't do that. I can't do that, I'm not gonna sell anything. I have to do this the right way, I have to get my daughter back. And I still like remember these conversations like they were yesterday because it was really hard to walk away from getting money so fast. And I was literally struggling so hard, you guys. I was barely eating. I didn't have money for food. I mean, I was I was dead broke and I still said no. And that kind of grit and tenacity and just being a hustler with the ability to say no to that is hard, but it's so worth it because I would have gotten caught and I would have gone back to prison. So it was hard for me to say no, especially when I was starving and they're telling me like, you're doing this the wrong way. Just do it this way so you can get a car for your kid, a house for your kid, food for your kid. You know, and they were using that because that's, I mean, they're not bad people. This is literally all they know, you guys. All they know is selling dope and, and running around the streets. And they were genuinely just trying to help me. They weren't trying to put me back in prison. Their mindset's just different than mine. And I no longer speak to them, but I also had someone, that knew me from prison that moved diagonally across the street in Springdale and she said, girl, get in the car, we're gonna go to Fort Smith, we're gonna sell some stuff, I'll give you some cash for riding with me and you know, having my back. And I said, I really appreciate the offer, but I can't go. And just saying no to situations, saying no to people, saying no to having, 
having drug money was really hard because one, money was my weakness. Money is my trigger. Number two, I was starving and I still said no because I just knew better. Yeah, I might have money today, but tomorrow I could go to prison. And slowly but surely, I got things that I needed. I got clothes. I was able to fight my DHS case and win my DHS case. And I know without a shadow of a doubt, if I got, had went around those people, if I got those fronts, if I went in that car with that chick and went to Fort Smith and sold dope, I would 100% be in prison and my daughter would still be in foster care. So I want you guys to take something from this story. I want you guys to know that getting your life together outside of prison is really freaking hard but it is not impossible. You just have to want it more than anyone else. You have to fight through temptation, fight through triggers, fight through people trying to pull you down. Even when they come at you from really good, like my friends had good intentions because that's all they knew, but I had to separate myself from those people and just say, you know what, I'm gonna do it my way. Even, even when people were telling me, you're doing this wrong, you're gonna lose your kid, you don't have enough time for that, I proved them wrong. I had people doubting my success from the minute my feet hit the concrete. From the minute Sally Port doors opened and I walked out of prison, people were doubting me. The guard said, I'll hold your mail for you, New York. You'll be back. I know you're going to come back. They talk crap like that. I had people at the halfway house tell me because my attitude was bad, aka, I don't want to hang out with you and talk war stories with you, that I was going to relapse. I had people constantly putting me down telling me that I wasn't going to ever be shit that I was always gonna be an inmate, I was always gonna be an addict, I was always gonna use, I was always gonna find myself back in cuffs. And I am sitting here right now, living proof, and I'm sitting here, a success story. Not because of my YouTube success, because of my mentality, because of my family, my sobriety, that is success to me. My happiness, my freedom, that is success. And I am so proud of myself, but I know a couple bad decisions could take it all away. I know if I compromise my inner circle, if I go around people that do not have my best interest at heart, I could find myself back in that cell. I have to be very selfish with who I let around me. I have to be very careful about where my thoughts go. Our mind is 70% negative and redundant, so we have to be really careful about what we choose to meditate on. And when I was younger, I was obsessed with drug dealing. I would meditate on it. I would watch stories about Freeway Rick Ross, about George Young. Um, Pablo Escobar. I would watch these stories. I'd watch Casino and Goodfellas. I'd see these hustlers and I thought, this is amazing. That's the life I want to live. I never once saw the end of the movie. I never saw the end of Blow where George Young is getting put in federal prison forever. I didn't watch the ending. I only watched the beginning. <laughs> and I only saw the beginning. It didn't matter how many times I watched that complete movie. My mind was focused on all the money. My mind was focused on having buckets and buckets of money and because I meditated on that, because I, all I wanted was that, that's where my life ended up. I ended up in a maximum security prison. And I'm so grateful for it because it allowed me to take a step back and reevaluate my life. Is this really what you want to do? I hated who I used to be. And it was in prison that I decided, give sobriety all of the effort that you have given your addiction and your, your business, give sobriety that same amount of effort and just see what happens. Do it for a year and see what happens. And in a year, I had a car and a place and a good man and I won my DHS case. So it is possible. I'm going to end it here, but I just want you guys to know that sobriety is possible, recovery is possible, and you, we need to break recidivism, break the statistic. Do not go back to prison. You have one life. It should not be wasted inside of a prison cell. I love you guys. Stay safe, stay sober, and I'll see you in my next one.